Andrew Womack Ministries presents part three in Lessons from Elijah, a six-part series. This teaching by Andrew is titled, Holy Fire. We pray that the Word of God will come alive in your heart as you listen. So we've already dealt with 1 Kings chapter 17. And if you look over in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus referred to this drought during the time of Elijah, it said it was for three and a half years. It doesn't give that time here in 1 Kings, but it does over in Luke chapter 4. Jesus spoke that and revealed it was for three and a half years that this drought persisted. And so in chapter 18, 1 Kings 18, 1, it says, It came to pass after many days, exactly three and a half years, that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So let me point out again that this whole thing started in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, by Elijah had a word from God, and he came and delivered that word. And that's what started everything. Some people think you have to hear an audible voice to get a word from God, but all Elijah was doing was... Um, speaking out what Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 16 and 17 had already said, the written Word of God that Moses wrote down, God speaking through him. And he just spoke the Word of God, the prophecy that if they turned away from God, that there would be a famine come. So he just spoke the Word, and that's what started it. Here again is another Word that comes to him. And I've made this point, but it, ne it bears repeating that we have words from God, word about what salvation is, about who the true God is, that He is not the God that is telling people to go out and kill other people in the name of Allah. That's not the true God. That's not the God that we serve. We've got the truth, and we need to be sharing this with people. We need to be sharing the truth with people that God is not the one who created a hundred and something genders Jesus said that from the beginning, God made them male and female. That's a word from God, and we need to be speaking it. Elijah is one of the greatest characters in the Bible, but it really all boils down to he could hear God, and he spoke the Word of God. That's what made him great. The Word of God is how his faith came. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. So right here, the Word of the Lord came unto Elijah, and he didn't act until the Word of the Lord came unto him. When the Word came, he wasn't silent, but he also wasn't vocal when the Lord wasn't speaking. You have to have enough sense to be able to speak what God says and not amplify it, not improve upon it, not add to it. And so he waited, and here he was three and a half years later, and the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Go show yourself unto Ahab, and he'll send rain on the earth. And so in verse 2, Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. And I'm just going to summarize some of this, but he meant a man named Obadiah who worked for the king. He was one of the officers of the king. And he showed himself unto Obadiah and told him to go tell Ahab that he would show himself to Ahab that day. And Obadiah responded. Um, let me just read some of this in verse 7. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him, and fell on his face and said, Art thou that my lord Elijah? And he answered, I am. Go tell thy lord, behold, Elijah is here. And he said, this is Obadiah said, What have I sinned that thou wouldst deliver my servant unto the hand of Ahab to slay me? As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom whether my Lord hath not sent to seek thee. And when they said he is not here, he took an oath of them uh, that uh, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation, and they, that they found him not. And now thou sayest, Go tell my Lord, behold, Elijah is here, and it shall come to pass as soon as I am gone from thee that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. And so in other words, what he's saying is, Elijah had become the focal point of King Ahab's attention. Why? 
BECAUSE HE HAD A WORD FROM GOD THAT HE SPOKE. HE DIDN'T JUST STAY IN HIS PRAYER CLOSET AND PRAY. HE HAD SPOKEN IT OUT. AND WHEN ALL OF THE THINGS THAT ELIJAH PREDICTED STARTED HAPPENING, THEN AHAB KNEW WHO IT WAS BECAUSE OF, AND HE WAS SEEKING FOR ELIJAH. HE WAS LOOKING FOR HELP. HE WAS WANTING ELIJAH TO END THIS DROUGHT BECAUSE ELIJAH HAD SAID IN 1 KINGS 17, 1, THAT THERE WON'T BE RAIN UNTIL I SAY SO. SO HE WAS THE KEY TO BREAKING THIS DROUGHT. AND AHAB HAD BEEN LOOKING FOR HIM, AND HE HAD GONE TO EVERY KINGDOM ON THE EARTH SEEKING FOR ELIJAH, AND WHEN HE COULDN'T FIND HIM, HE TOOK AN OATH THAT THEY WEREN'T HIDING HIM. AND NOW OBADIAH SAYS, IF YOU TELL ME THAT YOU'RE GOING TO SHOW YOURSELF TO um, AHAB, THE SPIRIT OF THE LORD WILL CATCH YOU UP, AND IF HE CAN'T FIND YOU, HE'LL SLAY ME FOR LYING TO HIM. SO this, THERE'S SOME THINGS HERE THAT REALLY SHOW HOW THAT IT WAS BECAUSE HE HAD A WORD FROM GOD AND HE SPOKE THAT WORD AND ACTED ON IT, THAT THAT HAD PROPELLED HIM TO BEING THE MOST IMPORTANT PERSON IN THE KINGDOM. EVEN THE KING WAS LOOKING FOR HIM. IF YOU WANT INFLUENCE, THE WAY YOU'RE GOING TO GET IT IS BY TAKING THE WORD OF GOD AND SPEAKING IT. AND YES, THERE WILL BE CRITICISM, AND YES, YOU ARE MAKING YOURSELF VULNERABLE AND PEOPLE WILL COME OUT AGAINST YOU, BUT I TELL YOU, A PERSON WITH THE WORD FROM GOD IS NEVER, NEVER AT THE MERCY OF A PERSON WITH ANYTHING ELSE. IT DOESN'T MATTER IF THEY HAVE THE GOVERNMENT BEHIND THEM OR ANYTHING ELSE. THE WORD OF GOD IS THE MOST IMPORTANT THING YOU'LL EVER DO. YOU KNOW, I HAD AN INSTANCE IN VIETNAM ONCE WHERE I WAS DOING A BIBLE STUDY, AND I HAD ABOUT SIX GUYS OR SO THAT WERE IN THIS BIBLE STUDY, AND AN ATHEIST WALKS IN AND SETS DOWN, AND AFTER JUST A FEW MINUTES, HE STARTED ASKING ME SOME QUESTIONS, AND BASICALLY, HE JUST OUT-TALKED ME. HE ASKED ME QUESTIONS. I WAS YOUNG IN THE LORD, AND I DIDN'T KNOW THE ANSWER TO HIS QUESTIONS. AND HE OUT-TALKED ME, AND HE STOOD UP AND HE SAID, THERE IS NO GOD. AND HE RIDICULED ME, AND HE SAYS, I'M LEAVING. WHO WILL GO WITH ME? AND ALL OF MY BIBLE STUDIES, SIX GUYS WALKED OUT WITH THE ATHEIST. AND, YOU KNOW, I WAS FEELING REALLY LIKE A FAILURE, LIKE, MAN, THAT WAS TERRIBLE. BUT WITHIN JUST A FEW MINUTES, THIS ATHEIST WALKS BACK IN AND SITS DOWN. I WAS IN A CHAPEL uh, LIBRARY-TYPE SETTING. AND HE SITS DOWN, AND AFTER THE THING CLEARED OUT, HE WALKS OVER TO ME AND HE SAYS, I WANT WHAT YOU HAVE. AND I WAS SHOCKED BECAUSE HE HAD JUST MADE A FOOL OUT OF ME. AND YET HE WANTED WHAT I HAD. AND I SAID, WHY DO YOU WANT WHAT I HAVE? AND HE SAYS, I'M A PRINCETON GRADUATE. MY WHOLE LIFE IS BASED ON INTELLECTUAL ARGUMENTS. HE SAID, I JUST OUT-ARGUED YOU. I MADE A FOOL OUT OF YOU. IF SOMEBODY DID THAT TO ME, I'D KILL MYSELF. HE SAYS, MY WHOLE LIFE IS BASED AROUND JUST MY INTELLECT. AND HE SAYS, BUT YOU'VE GOT SOMETHING THAT GOES BEYOND JUST INTELLECT. HE SAYS, YOU BELIEVE THAT GOD IS WITH YOU. BECAUSE HE WAS TELLING ME THAT THERE IS NO GOD. AND I SAID, I KNOW THERE'S A GOD. I TALKED TO HIM TODAY. HE TALKS TO ME. I SAID, I TALKED TO HIM. YOU CAN'T TELL ME THERE ISN'T A GOD. I HAD A RELATIONSHIP WITH THE LORD THAT WENT BEYOND JUST INTELLECTUAL THINGS. AND ANYWAY, I GOT TO LEAD THIS GUY WHO CLAIMED TO BE AN ATHEIST TO FAITH IN THE LORD, AND HE GOT BORN AGAIN. SO MY POINT IS THAT, SEE, SOME PEOPLE ARE INTIMIDATED BY PEOPLE THAT HAVE DEGREES BEHIND THEIR NAME. YOU COULD HAVE 30 DEGREES AND STILL BE FROZEN. (laughs) AMEN. YOU NEED SOMETHING BEYOND THAT. AND IF YOU HAVE THE WORD OF GOD, AND IF IT'S REAL TO YOU AND LIVING ON THE INSIDE OF YOU, YOU SHOULD NOT FEEL INFERIOR TO ANYBODY ELSE. ELIJAH HAD A WORD FROM GOD, AND WHEN HE ACTED ON IT, IT PROPELLED HIM TO A PLACE TO WHERE THE KING HAD SEARCHED EVERY NATION ON THE FACE OF THE EARTH LOOKING FOR HIM. IT PROPELLED HIM TO A PLACE OF INFLUENCE. AND I TELL YOU, IT WOULD HAPPEN IN YOUR BUSINESS. IT WOULD HAPPEN IN YOUR CHURCH. IT WOULD HAPPEN IN YOUR CIRCLE OF FRIENDS. IT WOULD HAPPEN IN YOUR SCHOOL. IT WOULD HAPPEN WHEREVER YOU ARE IF YOU WERE TO SPEAK GOD'S WORD. DO IT IN LOVE. DO IT OUT OF COMPASSION. SPEAK THE TRUTH IN LOVE, BUT SPEAK THE TRUTH, AND I GUARANTEE YOU, IT WILL PROPEL YOU TO A POSITION OF INFLUENCE. WHEN I GOT DRAFTED IN MY BASIC TRAINING, IT WAS, IT WAS BAD. YOU KNOW, THINGS AREN'T TODAY THE WAY THAT THEY WERE, uh, SAY, 40-SOMETHING YEARS AGO. I MEAN, IT WAS, IT WAS BAD. IT WAS JUST A MILL THAT THEY WERE RUNNING YOU THROUGH TO PUT YOU IN VIETNAM AND AND A LOT OF THOSE PEOPLE WERE GOING TO DIE. AND ANYWAY, THERE WAS TERRIBLE, TERRIBLE THINGS BEING DONE THERE, UNGODLY THINGS. AND I STOOD UP, AND I SPOKE THE WORD OF GOD. I DIDN'T SIT THERE AND RAIL ON ANYBODY. I WASN'T MEAN-SPIRITED ABOUT IT. 
But I spoke the truth, so much so that did you know that my drill sergeant, every day we would go through physical training and do things, but we would also have classes in the afternoon. And every single day, my drill sergeant, we would have like three classes in the afternoon. Every class, he would have me stand up in front of the class. There was 200 people in my group, and he would have me stand there And he would either have a person tell about how they'd gone into a prostitute that weekend and what it was like to have sex with a prostitute, or he would have them stand up and tell the dirtiest joke that they could possibly think of. And he would make me stand at attention right next to the person who was doing all this. And he'd say things like, you hate me, don't you, preacher? That's what he called me, preacher. And and I'd say, nope, I'm praying for you. And they ridiculed me three times a day for eight weeks. But did you know, as a result, every person in that company knew I was a Christian. And I got to witness to bunches of people. And I'd have people on the slide who called me over to the side when we had free time and say, could you please pray for me? And I got to lead people to the Lord and stuff. And so I'm saying I stood up and I spoke God's Word and it opened up doors for me and gave me opportunities to minister to people. And yes, I was ridiculed for it. And yes, there were some people who made fun of me. And it wasn't always comfortable. But I'm telling you, just like Elijah, this is one of the lessons I learned. We have the Word of God. And if you would speak it, people in their heart know the truth. The Holy Spirit will bear witness with it. But if you don't speak up, He can't bear witness. There's some people that think, I'm just going to be a witness. I'm not going to talk to anybody, but I'm just going to show the Lord in my actions. Did you know if you don't speak forth the Word and tell people that it's God who's caused you to be able to handle this situation and it's God who caused you to love these people that are unlovable. If you don't give God the credit for it, then they'll just write it off that you're some kind of a good person and you'll get the credit. And the Holy Spirit won't be able to bear witness. It says in John chapter 14, verse 26, it says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and lead you into all truth and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have spoken unto you. God brings back the Word of God to people. He bears witness with the Word of God, not just your goodness. It's the Word of God that's the sharp two-edged sword. You've got to speak God's Word. This is what I see in Elijah's life. And this just blesses me so much that here is this man who was a nobody and he just showed up. And when he spoke God's Word and gave it time and they started seeing God's Word come to pass, the king had searched for him throughout the entire known world. And I can truthfully say that, you know, I'm not the sharpest knife in a drawer. I hadn't been to cemetery, I mean seminary. I hadn't had all of these things going for me. But you know what I've got? I've got the Word of God. And I speak the Word of God. I speak things that God has spoken to me. And because I speak this Word, God has increased my influence. We now can be seen by over 5 billion people a day on our television programs. And it's not because of my great personality or good looks. I can guarantee you that. It's because of the Word of God. God's Word is what He promotes. He's not out to promote you. He's out to promote His Word. It's the truth that sets people free. You aren't what sets people free. It's the truth. And Jesus said in John 17, 17, Thy Word is truth. God's Word is truth. You must be speaking the Word of God. Man, I learned that from Elijah, and because of it, it gives me boldness. And so after Obadiah had said all of these things, in verse 13, 1 Kings 18, 13, it says, Was it not told my Lord what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water? Now this becomes really significant later on in the story. Because later on in 1 Kings chapter 19, when the Lord appears unto Elijah after he had gotten fearful of Jezebel and ran away from where he was supposed to be and the Lord appeared unto him, he says, what are you doing here, Elijah? You should be there where the revival is, where these people have turned to the Lord. But he wasn't all there. He was here. He was was running in fear of Jezebel. 
And he said, what are you doing here? And Elijah's answer was, I'm the only one left and they're seeking my life to take it from me. This right here shows you that that was not the truth. And Elijah knew it because Obadiah told him right here in verse 13 that he had hidden a hundred of the Lord's prophets in a cave during this entire drought and had been feeding them with bread and with water. So when Elijah said, I'm the only one, it wasn't the truth and he knew it wasn't the truth. And here's another great lesson that, you know, there's people today that they'll say like things like, well, my life is just wasted. Nobody loves me. And they know it's not true. They know that there's some good in their life. They may have problems, but there's some good and there are some people that love them. If nothing else, your parents or your wife, your children, your dog, somebody. And yet people, it doesn't matter what truth is. It's just, I feel this so passionately. That's what Elijah was doing over in 1 Kings chapter 19. He was now an emotional wreck and he was just operating in self-pity and because of it, he even asked God to take away his life. He was going to commit spiritual suicide rather than him do it. He was asking God to kill him. And you know, it was all because he had left reality and he was letting emotions overcome him. He knew, according to what Obadiah said, that there were still a hundred prophets of the Lord alive. And yet he said, I, even I only am left serving you. I tell you what, when you get into that Elijah syndrome where you think that nobody has the problems that you have, you are being treated unfair, nothing is right, you ought to look at Elijah and see that, man, this is completely wrong. Elijah knew better, but he just chose to ignore it. There are some of you watching this program today that you're sitting there, and I'm saying this in love, and I'm being straight about it. You're sitting there sucking your thumb, talking about how bad everything is and complaining about everything, and you know that there is reality beyond that, but yet you're just letting your feelings overwhelm you. You know, God has been good to me. I could sit here and list things for days. God has blessed me financially, emotionally, people, all kinds of things. But I've also got problems. And you know, if I was to only look at the problems, if I was to look at the people that hate me and are lying and saying terrible things about me, I could get to where I'm sitting there sucking my thumb and saying, oh God, nobody loves me. And it would be an absolute lie. There are thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that have been touched through my life and ministry. I don't have access to all of them, but I know that God is touching people's lives whether they ever let me know it or not. But I can choose to focus on that or I could focus on the people who hate me and are saying terrible things. I've got thousands of blogs written about what a terrible person I am. And if all I did was focus on that, I could get as down and depressed as anybody else. But whenever I get to feeling like that, I remember Elijah. And I remember that Elijah, he knew the truth, but he just chose to go by how he felt. He looked at the people who were rejecting him and his failures instead of looking at the good things. And because of it, it cost him his ministry. God told him right after that, you go get your replacement, Elisha, and you anoint him. It cost him, and he never did fulfill everything that God called on him to do because he let his emotions get the best of him. This is another lesson to learn from Elijah. So right here, Obadiah said that he had been feeding a hundred ministers for this entire drought, three and a half years, and Elijah promised him, he says, look, I promise you that today I will appear and Ahab. And so with that promise, Obadiah went to find Ahab, and when he found him, he told him. And then Elijah appeared unto him. In verse 17, it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troublest Israel? Man, I love this. Look at his answer. He said, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and has followed Balaam. Boy, this is so pertinent to us today. This is right up to date. There are people that have embraced 
all of this ungodliness that's being promoted in our world today, homosexuality, transgenderism, the wokeness and the 1619 project and all of this stuff. And if you stand up and say anything against it, they'll say, you're the one that's causing division in this nation. But my response is, it's not me that's causing the division. It's all of this wokeness. It's all of these lies. It's all of the ungodliness that is breaking over 250 years worth of godly tradition in this nation. And it's this ungodliness that's being crammed down people's throat that's a problem. And by us standing up and countering these lies and deceptions, we aren't the one troubling this nation. We aren't the one causing the division. It's all of the leftists. It's the liberals who are de- who have just totally forsaken any sense of reason and godliness and righteousness that's caused the problem. And by us highlighting it and bringing it to light and wanting to change and to go back to where uh, men are men and women are women and men marry women and women marry men instead of each other, we aren't the ones causing the trouble. It's the one who brought in all of this ungodliness that's causing the trouble. Man, I love this. This is a, this is a great lesson right here to learn from Elijah. And I guarantee you there's people today saying Christians are the problem. You and your morality are the problem. No, we aren't the problem. It's the ungodly who have rejected the foundations that this nation was built upon that are the problem. And we don't need to be the ones to be apologizing. And we don't need to accept this criticism that we're the problem. No, it's the other people that are the problem. And we're trying to solve the problem by going back and standing for truth in what the Word of God has to say. Boy, this is powerful. And then in the next verse, he says, Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal 450, and the prophets of the groves 400 that eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab... Uh, sent unto the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. You know, this is amazing, and I've made this point in the previous weeks numerous times. But the thing that propelled Elijah into a position of promise was because he had a word from God that he spoke. All of us as believers, we've got words from God. We've got words from God about what true salvation is, that Jesus is the only way, truth, and the life. We've got words from God, but sad to say a lot of Christians aren't speaking forth these things. But Elijah just didn't didn't stay in his prayer closet and pray. He spoke the Word of God, and because he did, it propelled him to a position of leadership. And here he is telling the king what to do. You gather all the prophets together. You gather all the people together to Mount Carmel. And Ahab, the king, was obeying the prophet because the prophet was bold speaking the Word of God. The Word of God has supernatural power in it, but only if you believe it. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2 says, The word preached unto them did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. You have to believe it, and then you have to speak it. And so here's Elijah. After three and a half years, he had been propelled to telling the king what to do because he was bold enough to speak the word of God. And so all of the people and all of these prophets came together on Mount Carmel and Elijah issued a challenge to the people. He says, let's have a test. Let's take two sacrifices and let's put them and put... uh, no uh, fire under it, but get the sacrifices ready and then we'll call on our God. I'll let Baal and his prophets call on him and I'll call on the true God of Israel and the God that answers by fire, he will be our God. In other words, he's challenging the prophets of Baal. You've got a doctrine, but you don't have any power. All you've got is just an argument. Let's have a demonstration of the power of God. And did you know it says that the people said, this is well spoken. You know, in our day, we've got a lot of people that have got all of these doctrines. There are people saying that children shouldn't have a sex assigned to them at birth. Let's just put down at first sex X and so that it's fluid and that you can choose. And they've got these doctrines, but the, all of the proof that goes with it, this is against science. It's against everything. And they've got this doctrine. But let's just see what's happening. 
Let's see what the results of it is. Did you know that suicide among teens is up like 30% in the last few years? And I can guarantee you a lot of it is because of the confusion that is being introduced into everything. And they need somebody to stand up and say, let's just see what the results are. I can show you the results of thousands and thousands and thousands of people who have heard the Word of God and the Word of God has literally changed their life. And then I can show you that the suicide rate is up at epidemic proportions. You talk about a pandemic. We got a pandemic of immorality and all of the destruction that it's causing. And I'm just saying, let's let's look and see what the results are. This is what Elijah did. Elijah said, let's have a demonstration. And you know, this is one of the things that the church as a whole, now there are, when I'm saying church, I'm referring to people who claim to be members of the body of Christ, people who may even be born again, but like it says over in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, people that have the form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. The gospel was never intended to be preached in word only, but in demonstration and power of the Spirit. Did you know Paul, he had people that were arguing against him in Corinth. And so he wrote the book of 1 Corinthians and he says, some say I'm of Apollos and some I'm of Paul and some I'm of Cephas and some I'm of Christ. And he tried to reason with them. And finally, I think it was in the fourth chapter of 1 Corinthians, he says, when I come, I'm not going to know the speech of those that are puffed up, but the power because the kingdom of God is not in word only, but it's in power and demonstration of the Spirit. So he basically used logic. He argued with them from Scripture to verify what he was saying. But he says, when I come, uh, we're going to put it to the test. And if you don't have any demonstration and power in your life, then you're going to have to shut up. And this is basically what uh, it says over in Mark chapter 16, that when the disciples went forth and preached, it says the Lord worked with them, confirming the word with signs and wonders following. These signs will follow them that believe. They will speak with new tongues. They'll take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Jesus said, if you truly believe on me, the works that I do will you do also and greater works than these will you do. Hebrews chapter 2 talks about that the gospel was preached and it was confirmed by the signs and the miracles. Even Jesus was confirmed by the miracles He did and then the apostles were confirmed. Today, we've got a lot of people that say they're representing God and they've got a doctrine, but they don't have any evidence. All of the evidence is is just confused lives and stuff, but they don't have changed lives. They don't have the miraculous power. They aren't seeing healings. They aren't seeing the miraculous things of God. And I tell you, the gospel was never intended to be preached that way. This is basically what Elijah was doing right here. Elijah was saying, you've got all this doctrine and you've got Jezebel, you know, uh, financing all of these prophets of Baal and the prophets of the groves and they've got an argument, but they don't have any power. Let's see the God who has power. And did you know that the people said, this is well spoken, but the prophets, they didn't like it. You know, I believe it's the same thing today. Preachers don't want to be either put up or shut up. They don't want to either you show me some power in your life and show me changed lives and show me miracles and things that are happening or you just get out of the ministry and quit preaching. Preachers don't want to do that because that puts them on the spot. But I guarantee you the people, I think they are just as receptive to this as they were in Elijah's day. So anyway, Elisha, Elijah enter, uh, gave this challenge And then the prophets, they obeyed. And so they took a bullet. He let them choose which bullet they want. They took the best bullet. They slew the bullet. They put it on the altar. They put wood under it, but they didn't put any fire to it. And Elijah let them go first. And he says, you call on your God and ask him to send fire, but you don't put any fire, not man-made fire. If this is truly God, if Baal is God, then let him prove it by doing something miraculous. And he let them go. And they went from early in the morning past midday. They were getting towards the evening sacrifice and they even cut themselves. They leapt on the altar. You know what all this was about was when they leapt on the altar, it was like, you know, oh, Baal, uh, send fire and I'll even offer myself as a sacrifice. They put themselves, they were making these commitments trying to barter with Baal. 
Did you know that there's a lot of people that claim to be Christians that don't have any power and demonstration in their life? And they do the same thing, maybe in a way that's not as obvious and as offensive, but it's the same thing. They're saying, oh God, if you'll do this, then I promise you I'll do this. They're sacrificing themselves and trying to make deals with God. That's not the way to approach God. The New Testament Christian approaches God through Jesus and through what Jesus did and your faith is in Jesus and the only hope that you have of receiving your miracle is because Jesus died and purchased it for you. You aren't bartering with God. Anytime a person starts bartering, God, if you'll do this, then I promise you I'll do this. I'll give up this. I'll serve you the rest of my life. You haven't really connected with God you are thinking that somehow or another your sacrifice is going to move God. I'm telling you, what you do is not what moves God. It's what Jesus did for you and the way you access that is through faith in Jesus. Man, I'm speaking to some people. There's some people watching this program right now that it's just like God removed blinders. Scales fell off your eyes and you see that, man, I'm trying to appropriate what God is able to do through my goodness, through me bartering, through me. You know, it's like it's no different really than these um, prophets of Baal leaping on the altar and cutting themselves, sacrificing, and oh God, look, Baal, look what I'm doing. Now would you move? No, that's not the way to approach God. So after they had done all of these things, Elijah began to mock them. I like this. And Elijah said unto them, let me just read this in verse 27, 1 Kings 18, 27. It came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is talking or he is pursuing or he is in a journey or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awakened. You know, all of these things are mocking the prophets of Baal. The Bible says that God never sleeps nor slumbers. So see, but but he was contrasting his saying, you've got an inferior God. Maybe he has to go to sleep or maybe he's on a journey and he can't hear you. The Bible says God will never leave us nor forsake us. He's, his ears are always open to our cry. So Elijah was just mocking them and pointing out the inferiority of their Baal worship. And I guarantee you the people today who are claiming to have a relationship with God, but they're denying the power of it. I guarantee you there is a place for godly people to stand up and to point out these discrepancies and to show them. You know, there's people that are probably listening to my program today and thinking, boy, well, you're being harsh. I'm not being harsh. I'm saying these things in love. I'm trying to point out that there is really no difference between so many people who call themselves Christians today and these prophets of Baal that didn't even claim to worship God. And I'm pointing that out not to hurt anybody, but to remove the scale so that you can see I need a personal relationship with Jesus and I need to approach God the Father through what Jesus did instead of through what I've done. There's a place for pointing this out. And this is what Elijah was doing. And in verse 28, it says, And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past that they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. Those who are trying to connect with God without going through Jesus, doing it the way that God ordained, I guarantee you, you can go through all your rituals, you can have all your liturgy, but it is useless. There is no voice, there's no answer, nothing is going to come through that. The only way to approach God is through the Lord Jesus Christ and faith in what He did for you, not faith in yourself, what you do for Him. Man, that's awesome. And look at this in verse 30. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Now he's about to call on God to send fire and consume this sacrifice. But the fire of God doesn't just fall indiscriminately anywhere. The fire of God falls where there is an altar that is built according to His specifications that is dedicated to Him. It doesn't fall on unholy things. And I guarantee you, if you want to see the power of God in your life, you need to have an altar. I'm not talking about a physical altar, but your heart. You need to purify it. You need to dedicate your heart to the Lord. The fire of God. There's reasons. 
You know, even um, lightning, people think that lightning is indiscriminate, but no, there are laws that govern this. This is why you can put a lightning rod on a building and the lightning will hit that lightning rod and then go down the wire into the ground and it will preserve the building and the building won't be destroyed because there's laws that govern this. I've actually heard and I've seen pictures and you know, you certainly can't observe this just in your own self, but they do slow motion and they actually show that there is a negative charge in the earth that attracts lightning and they show that lightning comes from the ground and meets the lightning in the air. You can't observe it with just your physical eye, but I've seen pictures of this. It is not indiscriminate. That's the reason that they say in a lightning storm, don't get under a tree because that tree will attract lightning. You stay out in the open and stuff. So there are reasons that lightning falls and strikes. There is reasons that the, the fire of God will fall and consume some people and not consume other people. And it's because they've made their heart prepared to receive the blessing of God. It says in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, I believe it's verse 19, it says that the eyes of the Lord are running to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking to show Himself strong in behalf of those who are perfect in His sight. Perfect here doesn't mean that you're sinless, but it means those who've prepared your heart, who've built an altar and are ready to receive the power of God. The eyes of the Lord are looking for this. God is looking for people that He can let the fire of God hit them. There are some of you today that are hungry for God. I'm telling you, if you want to experience God, Prepare your heart. This is what Elijah did. He prepared, repaired the altar. You got to remember that Ahab and Jezebel had forbidden the worship of the true God. They had torn down his altars and they had instituted Baal worship. So there had been an altar of God on Mount Carmel, but it was in disrepair. So Elijah, first of all, repaired the altar. And then it says, and Elijah took 12 stones, which is according to the 12 tribes of Israel. This is exactly the way that God gave instructions to Moses. He took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed." And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, Fill uh, four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Well, let me just summarize this, that he was going to call for fire to fall from heaven. And to make it even harder, he poured four barrels of water on this sacrifice to soak it and it ran down and filled up this trench. And he had him repeat this two other times. So a total of 12 barrels of water were poured on this sacrifice and just totally drenched it. And I believe that the reason he did this is so that nobody would think this was just spontaneous combustion. You know, they were in a drought. Everything was dry. I'm sure it was hot. Some people might have been trying to reason and say, well, this just, you know, happened because it was hot, spontaneous combustion. He wanted to remove any doubt. He wanted to make clear that this was the supernatural fire of God. And there is a lesson for us in this, that sometimes people, they're afraid that, you know, God doesn't have much power. They make it easy on the Lord. Like, for instance, a minister that's going to be building a building well, you know, it's limited. God, we may not be able to get much money, so let's make it as cheap as we possibly can. Let's make it as easy on God as we possibly can. You know, when I started building our Karis Bible College, the Lord had spoken to me that I was limiting Him by my small thinking. So when it came time to build our Bible College, I sat down and I built what I thought God wanted me to do. And I spent a year and a half and a million and a half dollars on architects and their fees before I ever sat down and said, how much is this going to cost? I did not build thing with the restraint of how much does it cost. And did you know God supplied the need and we built it debt free. I could have built something cheaper and have only shot at this level. And you know what? God would have meant me there and I could have built it debt free there. Or I could just build what I think glorifies God. You don't have to worry about God not having enough power to produce. Man, Elijah 
made it hard so that this had to be supernatural. The sacrifice was totally drenched. The wood was wet. There was no way that this was going to be some accident. If this fire fell and consumed the sacrifice, it was going to be miraculous. You don't need to be afraid of God running out of power. You need to speak bold. You need to speak big and quit being timid and shy. God is looking for somebody who has some faith. This expressed a lot of faith on Elijah's part. Look at this in chapter 18, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. Now this is significant too. You know, we're taking lessons from Elijah and Elijah repaired the altar. He made a place for the fire of God to fall. And I've said, we've got to prepare our heart that God's fire, he doesn't light a fire on the inside of people who aren't committed and dedicated to him. Here he is, not only did he repair the altar, but it was the time of the evening sacrifice. The law of Moses dictated that there was a morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice. So it was not only preparing his heart, but it had to be done the way that God told him to do it. There was supposed to be an evening sacrifice. He wasn't just inventing some new thing. He wasn't asking God to do something that hadn't happened before. Did you know when the tabernacle was dedicated in Leviticus chapter 9, the fire of God fell from the altar. When Solomon dedicated the temple, fire fell from God and consumed the sacrifice. It wasn't man-made fire. So this had happened before and he was going back and repairing the altar, doing things the way that God had instituted. You can't just take what I'm talking about and saying, let's show the power of God and you can't just go use God's power to advance your own thing and do things your own way. You need to go back to what the Word says. This nation needs to go back to to the foundation that this nation was founded on. Godly people founded this nation and dedicated it to God and based it upon biblical principles. We need to go back to doing things the way that it's supposed to be done, not just believe that God is your genie that you can ask to do whatever you want to. But man, you can go back to what the scripture says where it says, go heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. Cast out devils. Freely you receive, freely give. That's scripture. That's Matthew chapter 10. We can do that. And by the grace of God, I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back, but I'm saying that the word works and that we need to have more demonstration of it. I have seen blind eyes open. I've seen deaf ears open. I've seen people come out of wheelchair. I've seen people raised from the dead. I have seen the power of God in demonstration. And there's all kinds of people that criticize me And this is one of the things they criticize me over. They say those things don't happen today. Well, you're just too late to tell me they don't happen. I've got doctor's reports proving that I was healed of incurable diseases. We've got 40-something testimonies where people have been to doctors and have had it verified that they've been... We had uh, Benjamin Esau raised from the dead in South Africa. We've got that on video. We've had Mercy Santos healed of multiple sclerosis that when I first met her, she was in a wheelchair and we've got her own video running. We've got people that, uh, you know, just everything that you can imagine. Lyme disease, heart problems, uh, fibromyalgia, just on and on and on it goes. The power of God is still in demonstration today but you can't just do your own thing and ask God to bless it. You've got to do what God told us to do. And he said that the prayer of faith would save the sick. So he repaired the altar at the evening sacrifice. And then look at what he said. He came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel. And again, man, I could go into more detail on this, but the nation of Israel had forsaken the true Lord God and they were into Baal worship. And yet Elijah just went ahead and called it the way it was. He says, he is the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, whether they acknowledged it or not. Here's another thing. Elijah wasn't doing this to promote himself. He wasn't saying, God, let this be done so that people will respect me and honor me and that I can have a following and that my mailing list will increase. Lord, do this to honor me. No, he's saying, I'm doing this so that people will know that you are the Lord God of Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all of these things at thy word. This is a very important piece of information that Elijah just didn't come up with this on his own. 
He had a word from God. If you go back to the first verse of this 18th chapter, it says, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came unto Elijah. And God is the one that instituted this whole challenge. God is the one that inspired him to do all of those things. This is so important. If you're being inspired to stand up for the Lord and start speaking, you need to make sure that you don't do it in a way that is trying to build you up to draw attention to you. You are trying to glorify the Lord and you are truly representing Him. God is not going to share His glory with another. God is not going to build you up. He's not going to glorify you. He's going to glorify Himself. Elijah is saying, I'm doing these things at the word of the Lord. I was instructed to do this. He didn't hatch this. This wasn't his idea. Boy, these things are very, very important that I'm sharing. And then he says in verse 37, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell. Before I go on and read this, let me just contrast this with the prophets of Baal that for nearly 12 hours, 10 or 12 hours, they had been cutting themselves until the blood gashed out. They had leapt upon the altar. They had pleaded with God, there with Baal. There was nothing. Elijah just prayed a real simple prayer. It only took two verses, probably less than a minute. He just said some real simple things. And look at this in verse 38. And the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, the wood, the stones and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. Man, this wasn't just a little fire. This was miraculous. We don't know exactly how this happened, but we find later in the same chapter that Elijah went to pray, and there wasn't a cloud in the sky. So this wasn't like just a normal bolt of lightning that just randomly happened to strike at the exact moment that he was speaking. There wasn't a cloud in the sky, and this fire a bolt of lightning or I don't know what it was, and it licked up not only the sacrifice, the wood, the water, but the stones. It probably made a crater. I mean, who knows what this was? It was dramatic. It was supernatural. There was no doubt that this was God. And look at the results of the people. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord... He is the God, the Lord. He is the God. Man, this is awesome. An entire nation, when I believe that probably uh, Ahab and Jezebel were forcing this Baal worship on them. And I'm sure that there were people who were deceived and fell in line with it, but there was probably lots of people that were at the very least indifferent towards it and just going along. And there were also people that were opposed to this. But nonetheless, when the supernatural manifestation of the power of God happened, the entire nation fell down. The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. Did you know the same thing would happen today if people would stand up and quit apologizing for the gospel and quit apologizing that Adam, that God made them Adam and Eve and that marriage is between two people and they'd quit apologizing uh, and saying, well, you know, Christianity is just one religion and we don't want to make anybody else feel bad. No, we have to sit there and say that there is truth and there is error and that people who don't believe that Jesus is the only way, truth, and the life to the Father, that they're in error and they're sending people to hell and people are going to miss it because they're being deceived. We need to stand up and speak the truth and if we would do that, the fire of God will fall today. The fire of God will just light up people. There are people watching this program right now that I guarantee you God's lighting a fire in your heart to stand up and to begin to proclaim the truth of the Word of God. And look at what else happened right here in the 40th verse. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. Over in, I believe it's the uh, 14th verse or the 13th verse, Obadiah, or excuse me, it's not, it's not that verse, but right here it's in the 19th verse. Elijah said, You gather the prophets of Baal together, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400. 
So there was a total of 850 people. Right here it says that they gathered together the prophets of Baal. That was 450 men. We don't know if that includes the prophets of the groves because they were there, but in at least 450 prophets of Baal were slain, possibly 850 people slain, and the people took them and surrounded them. I can guarantee you the prophets of Baal, when they saw the handwriting on the wall and they knew what was happening, they would have scattered if they could. But the people surrounded them. And it says that Elijah slew them. We don't know if he did it personally or if the people under his direction are the ones that slew them, but they slew these 850 prophets of Baal. There's some people that think, well, this is just terrible. You're advocating killing people. No, I'm not. And if you go out and say that I am, then you are just out and out lying. This is not what I'm saying. Under the New Testament, in Acts chapter 13, verse 39, the Scripture says that we can be cleansed from all things from which we could not be cleansed under the law. So in the New Testament, it's different. In a sense, these prophets of Baal, they were demon-possessed. They had given themselves over to demonic powers. And in the Old Testament, people could not be delivered of demons. The blood of Jesus had not been shed. And so demon possession was like a cancer that couldn't be cured. The only thing you could do was cut it out. In the same way that people will cut off parts of your body and irradiate it and make you sick and make your hair fall out, and they'll do all of these terrible extreme things in an effort to kill cancer but they sacrificed parts of the body in order to do it. It was a similar thing. In the Old Testament, demon possession could not be cured because Jesus hadn't died and set us free from the dominion of the devil yet. And so it had to be treated like a cancer. And once a person became demon possessed under the Old Testament, you killed them. And that was harsh on those individuals, but it was actually an act of mercy upon the human race as a whole. It kept that cancer, this demonic stuff from spreading. Under the new covenant, because of Jesus, Jesus has totally changed everything. And today, people can be healed. They can be delivered of demonic things. We don't kill people who are of another religion. We share the truth with them and get them delivered from that deception. We don't kill homosexuals. We don't kill rebellious children, which in the Old Testament was the way it was dealt with. And again, it was because Jesus hadn't bought the freedom of people in the Old Testament the way we see it in the New Testament. So rebellion, it says in 1 Samuel 15, I believe it's verse 22, that rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. You just had to cut it out. So this is what Elijah did. He took them down and killed at least 450, maybe 850 prophets of Baal and of the groves. And there's a great lesson in that. Even though the punishment is different because Jesus suffered our punishment, it's still just as wrong today to see bestiality and homosexuality and adultery and lying and stealing. It's just as wrong today as it's ever been. It's just that there is now a payment and there is forgiveness available and you see a grace and mercy extended towards people under this new covenant that you didn't see under the Old Covenant. Man, that's awesome. But in the same way that Elijah didn't just have a duel with the false prophets and then just say, well, now just pick and choose, and he lets them just continue on. Man, he fought them until he consumed them. We need to have that same attitude today. That same attitude needs to persist. You don't need to just fight against sickness until it lessens to where you can live with it and you tolerate it. Man, a little bit of leaven will leaven the whole lump. You just need to purge out all of the leaven. You need to get rid of all sickness. You need to get rid of all unbelief. You need to get to where you don't tolerate little things from the devil. You know, I see great, great, great success in healing, not only in other people, but in myself. I walk in supernatural health. And one of the reasons that I do is because I don't tolerate headaches, I don't tolerate little things. 
Man, I fight a headache the way I'd fight cancer. And because of it, Satan is never able to go very far. Once he penetrates any perimeter around me and I start experiencing even the slightest little pain or anything, I'll fight that like it's cancer. And because of it, he just never gets very far into my space because I'll fight these things. I do not tolerate the devil. This is what David did. David even wrote that he said he pursued his enemy until he had destroyed them. He didn't chase them over the hill and allow them to regroup and come back and fight another day. He fought his enemies until he destroyed them. When he fought Goliath, he threw that stone and knocked Goliath on the ground. But it didn't say that the Philistines fled when they saw Goliath fall down. He could have tripped. Maybe he was just injured. Maybe he could get up and fight again. They were still standing there, but when David knocked Goliath down, he drew Goliath's own sword and stood on top of Goliath, cut his head off, held his head up, and once that was done, there was no doubt that Goliath was done for. And the enemy, the Philistines, scattered, and the Israelites pursued them. That's the attitude that you need to have. You don't need to just resist you know, if you're, if you're dealing with poverty, just fight it enough to where you get to where you can survive. No, you need to fight until you thrive. Until you just, you need to have this attitude. You need to be violent in your attitude. There are some people watching this that think, well, that's not Christian. Jesus is the one that said, Since the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven is preached, and the kingdom of heaven suffer violence, and the violent take it by force. That's out of Matthew chapter 11, around verse 12. And he said, The violent take it by force. Did you know you need to get violent, not with people? Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Our fight is not with people. Our fight is with the devil, but Satan flows through people. So I'm not against people. I pray for people who hate me and who despise the gospel and despise all of the morality that I preach and that I stand for. I pray for them and believe and pray that they will get converted and that God will open up their eyes and they'll receive. But I am 100% angry and against the demonic power that is working through them, that is trying to put men in women's restrooms and in women's locker rooms and in women's showers. That's demonic. Something's wrong with you if you don't hate that. Now, you don't have to hate the person. You can love them and pray that they will be convicted and converted. But you have to hate that demonic power that would allow men to go into a women's restroom and violate those women. You have to hate people that are wanting children to be taught about homosexuality and about anal sex and all of the things that are being promoted in even kindergarten. That's wrong. You ought to hate this kind of stuff. The scripture says in Romans chapter 12, verse 9, Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. There is evil today in this world, in this nation. There are people that are coming against all standards of morality and they are, they can't even decide if they're a male or a female, don't know which they are. All you got to do is check your plumbing and however God made you, that's who you are. I don't care how you feel. Amen. And I'll have people mad at me and stuff, but I tell you, I'm not compromising on this. This is the truth. I'm not the one that ought to feel weird for deciding that marriage has to be between a man and a woman, not two men or two women. I shouldn't feel weird. I shouldn't be apologetic for saying that. The other people that are telling you that two women can marry and two men can marry, they're the ones that ought to feel weird. That's weird. It's perverse. It's perversion. Amen. So one of the things, we don't sit there and kill people who are following the Word of God because through Jesus they can be forgiven. But you have to hate the evil just as much as Elijah hated the evil and dealt with it here. And so right after this, look in the next verse. In verse 21, or excuse me, verse 41, 1 Kings 18, 41, And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink. 
for there is the sound of abundance of rain. Did you know later, you see right here in just the next few verses, there wasn't even a cloud in the sky. There was no indication. This wasn't something that in the natural he heard rain. It was in his heart. God had spoken to him to have this duel, told him what would happen. He said down here in the 36th verse that he had done all of these things at the word of the Lord. The Lord told him to have this duel with the prophets of Baal, told him what was going to happen, and told him these things were going to happen. This wasn't something in the natural that he was hearing the sound of abundance of rain. It was in his heart. It was something that God had shown him in his heart. And boy, this is a truth that I could amplify on for weeks at a time. I've got another teaching entitled The Power of Imagination, how you have to see things on the inside before you see it on the outside. Elijah had seen that this drought that he called for and that lasted for three and a half years, he saw that this drought was going to be ended. So not only would the prophets of Baal be shown to be false prophets but he knew that God was going to send rain and once again deliver the people. And all of these things had been shown him and he had it in his heart. He wasn't hearing it with his ears. He couldn't see it with his eyes, but he saw it in his heart. And there's a lesson here that if you want to see the power of God manifest, you've got to spend time with the Lord. You've got to have a relationship with the Lord and you have to know some things in your spirit. You have to see it in your spirit before you see it in the physical realm. And there's a lot of people that are praying for healing of their body, but you've never seen yourself well. You're praying for financial breakthrough and miracles, but you've never seen yourself prosperous. You're praying for your marriage to be restored, but you've never seen it restored. You're praying for your children to be set free and come back to the Lord, but you've never seen it. You don't see things happen outwardly. That's not how it comes. It comes from the inside out. The way you receive the miracle of God is you first of all get it in your heart and then it manifests itself in the physical realm. Elijah just told Ahab, get up, head for Jezreel because I hear the sound of abundance of rain. Not with his physical ears, but he heard it in his heart. He already had this in his heart. You know, I can relate to this, that God has called me to build a Bible college and a campus, and we have now built $130 million worth of buildings in the last... Well, we did it in nine and a half years, but it's been over the last 13 years that we did this. And uh, did you know I had these things in my heart first? When we had the dedication of these buildings, I don't demonstrate the way some people do. I don't get really high and really low. I'm just kind of always the same. And at these building dedications, I wasn't just beside myself and screaming and running and jumping or dancing. And I was just kind of normal. And I had people come up, aren't you excited? And I said, yes, I'm excited. But did you know I was actually more excited when I saw it in my heart, when there was not a single blade of grass moved, no dirt moved, no buildings built. When I saw it in my heart, I was more excited then than when I see it with my eyes. Scripture says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, that we walk by faith and not by sight. Sad to say, most Christians walk by sight and not by faith, but it's normal. The way that God intended it to be is that we should walk by faith and not by sight. You ought to be able to see yourself healed and rejoice in the healing before you physically experience it. You ought to see yourself blessed and the buildings built and all of the things that you're believing for. You ought to be able to rejoice by faith before there is any physical proof of it. You ought to be able to rejoice over your marriage and over your children before you see those things. That is the normal Christian life that, sad to say, is abnormal for most people today. But this is the way that God intended it to be. And this is what you see about Elijah. He had already heard the sound of abundance of rain and there wasn't even a cloud in the sky. There was no indication of it, but he had it in his heart. If you don't get it in your heart, you'll never get it in your body. You'll never get it in your finances. You'll never get it in your family. I tell you what I'm saying, if you if your heart is open, if you are listening with your heart, 
God is speaking to people right now. There are some of you that desire these things and they're godly things. You're desiring the right thing, but you, you haven't seen it. It hasn't become a reality on the inside of you. And it comes from the inside out, not the outside in. There are people that God is speaking to right now. And you just need to humble yourself and say, God, open up the eyes of my heart. Help me to see this with my heart. Help me to get this in my heart first. You can pray some prayers. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 14 through the end of the chapter, he prays that God would open up the eyes of your understanding that you may see what is the hope of His calling, the exceeding greatness of His power towards us, the same power that He used when He raised Christ from the dead. That's in the first chapter of Ephesians. Then in the third chapter of Ephesians, there's another prayer pray that you would see the height, the depth, the length, the breadth, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. That sounds like an impossibility. If it passes knowledge, how can you know it? This is talking about an experiential, that you could experience it in your heart. You would get it. And that passes just mere intellectual understanding. If you get it in your heart and if you experience the love of God, you will be filled with all of the fullness of God. And then he says, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that works in us not according to something that comes from the outside, but you first of all have this power working on the inside of you and then it manifests. I tell you, God is speaking to people right now. You need these truths. This is an answer to things that you've been asking. Well, let me read this in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 42. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel And he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, Go up now, look towards the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel, and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. This phrase where it says he ran before Ahab, it means he beat Ahab to Jezreel, approximately 20 miles, and and Ahab had a head start and was in a chariot, and yet Elijah on foot with Ahab having a head start outran him. (laughs) That's amazing. It says the hand of the Lord was upon him. This wasn't normal. Man, Elijah was pumped. Elijah had just seen a three and a half year drought Ended. He had just seen the prophets of Baal totally overcome and eradicated. He had just seen the entire nation fall down and say, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. He had seen so much stuff. He was operating on uh, steroids. Man, his adrenaline was flowing. The hand of the Lord was on him and he outran a chariot in a 20-mile race giving the other guy a head start. This is pretty awesome. He was fired up. You know, in my situation, uh, it takes a lot of money to keep our ministry going. Not only our television ministry, which reaches 5 billion people a day, a potential. Not all of those watch, but 5 billion people have access to my program in, I think, eight different languages. And it takes a lot of money to do that and keep the translations and the editing and all that going. But we're building uh, facilities. We're starting to build student housing. And it just takes a lot of money. So I pray and I believe that God supplies my need. But then it's not enough to just believe that I've got it. I need to see the physical manifestation. And so I really don't pray about money very often. But if I ever do, I'll just believe that I receive. And then if I need to see the physical manifestation, I won't go ask for it over and over. But I'll say, Father, I know that you're going to use people. You aren't going to just cause money to fall out of the sky. You aren't going to counterfeit United States currency. 
you are going to supply my need through people. It says in Luke 6, 38, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. The way God multiplies your giving and causes it to come back to you is through men. God's not going to just rain it out of the sky. So I'll pray and believe that I receive, and then I'll say, Father, I know you're speaking to people. And so I ask you that people just open up their heart that, you know, if they want to give and don't have it, well, then bless them and help prosper them. If somebody just doesn't, isn't thinking about it, bring this to their attention and I'll intercede for other people. See, I'm still praying, but I'm not praying multiple prayers. It's just one prayer. I believe that I receive, but God, I may need to continue in prayer to break Satan's bondage, to open up somebody's heart to respond to the Lord, to help meet the need. I might need to build up my faith and and encourage myself. So a lot of times once I pray for something, I'll spend time praying in tongues and I'll... I'll pray in tongues because the Bible says you build up yourself on your most holy faith, praying in tongues, praying in the Spirit. Jude chapter 1, verse 20. And so I'll pray in tongues and build myself up. So I may pray about something for a week or two or whatever period of time, but I'm not praying over and over and asking God to heal me. So here's some of the lessons that we can learn. Elijah prayed one prayer and it didn't rain for three and a half years. Then he prayed again, James chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. One prayer, and he sent his servant seven times. He didn't quit praying until he saw some results. He, he didn't have to see the full manifestation. It says that the servant came back and says, there's a little cloud arising out of the Mediterranean Sea about the size of a man's hand. Did you know I've actually gone to Israel? I went on Mount Carmel. And I stood there and it was a perfectly clear day. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. And after the rest of the tour group left, I stood there for a while and I was just looking and imagining what Elisha, Elijah went through. And as I looked towards the Mediterranean Sea, there was a little cloud about the size of a man's hand. I mean, it was just exactly what this says. I believe that the Lord was helping me to picture and imagine what Elijah went through. And I mean, it was small, tiny. You from up there on the top of Mount Carmel, you could see a long ways. And to see one little tiny cloud about the size of a man's hand, that's not much. But see, Elijah, he knew that he, w- he was going to see this come to pass. He was believing. And it's like Satan, he can dam up God's supply. But once you see that dam beginning to spring, spring a leak and you see cracks in the dam and you see water oozing out, you know it's just a matter of time. That dam is done for and that praise God, that thing is going to break. And all of these blessings and answers to prayer that Satan has been holding back are about to just be wiped out and all of this flood of God's blessing. That's what Elijah was doing. He knew that, man, this drought had gone on for three and a half years and that there was this inertia to overcome. And he prayed one prayer. He sent his servant seven times, but it was just one prayer. And the moment he saw the tiniest little manifestation of his answer to prayer, he knew it was done. And he got up and it said he girded up his loins. You know what this is talking about? People in those days, they wore robes. And so he had a robe down to his ankles. And when you ran, this robe could get in your way, could get caught in your legs, you could trip, fall. So what they would do, they would put their hand between their legs, grab the back part of the robe and pull it up through their legs and tuck it into their belt or what they called a girdle. And it basically made it like it was shorts so that your robe wouldn't get in your way. So he girded up his loins The Spirit of God came upon him and he outran Ahab who had a head start and a chariot and he outran him for 20 miles and beat Ahab to Jezreel. Man, this was awesome. I can only imagine what must have been going through Elijah's heart. But think about this. Three and a half years, he came to the king and the king was killing anybody who identified themselves 
as a prophet of the God of Israel. And yet in total boldness and defiance, he came and said, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, which it had been forbidden to even say those things. Here he was boldly speaking this out. And he spoke, and instead of being killed, God supernaturally protected him, sent him to a brook, and for an undeclosed period of time, ravens brought him bread and flesh. It was miraculous. God sustained him through this drought. When the brook dried up, then God sent him to the city of Zarephath. And there was a widow woman there who God had spoken to and prepared her and she was looking for someone to sustain. And he came and says, give me first. And he took her last little bit of food out of her mouth which some people had criticized him, but he wasn't taking from that woman. He was giving to her. And he took this and God multiplied her last little bit of food. And for around three years, God supernaturally multiplied this little food and sustained her and Elijah and her son. And then the son died and he prayed and saw the son raised from the dead the very first time in biblical history that anything like that was recorded. And then he came and he challenged uh, the prophets of Baal to a duel. And he had this thing where let's put a sacrifice here, but not put fire with it in the God that answers by fire. He's the true God. And God the Father, the God of Israel answered and the people fell on their face saying, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. He killed all of the prophets of Baal. He ended Baal worship. And then he ended the drought and prayed and outran a chariot. All of those things. Man, there wasn't a single failure. It was all successes. He was just a string of unbroken successes, seeing the power of God. Saw an entire nation turn to God and saw the king who had forced the people to start worshiping Baal. He saw the king doing whatever he told him to do. He wasn't the king, but he was in authority above the king. He was actually giving instructions to the king. Just imagine what that could do to your ego. And did you know as we enter into chapter 19, I'm out of time today, but I'll just lay the foundation for it. The scripture says in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Elijah got lifted up in pride. Elijah thought he was better than his fathers. He thought things had been done through him that had never been done through anybody else. And he stepped out of dependence upon God and he stepped into his own ability. He got to reading his own press releases and he got lifted up with pride. And again, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. The moment you get in to pride, you are headed for defeat. I'm going to deal with this on tomorrow's program, but let me just say that the the most vulnerable time in your entire life is not when you're under pressure, not when things are going badly. Even a person with a minimal commitment to the Lord will turn to the Lord when things are beyond their control and there's no way out except through God. People with marginal commitments to the Lord will seek God when their back's against the wall. But did you know when most people quit seeking God, when most people become independent and they get to operating on their own is when everything's going well. And Elijah had nothing but success. He had seen things happen that no other human being had ever experienced. And because of it, he got full of himself. And I tell you, it doesn't matter if you have USDA choice flesh. If you get in the flesh... The moment you're in the flesh, the flesh cannot please God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither in dead deed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. We hope your heart has been quickened by hearing the Word of God through this message. It's the faithful support of people like you who make this ministry possible. We invite you to prayerfully consider becoming a partner with Andrew Womack Ministries. We maintain a website at awmi.net. Our helpline number is 719-635-1111. Or you can write us at P.O. Box 3333, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 80934. Until next time, we pray that you'll reach out by faith and receive everything that's yours through God's grace.